conjunction with the work we do around hours of service. And just one example that I would mention is uh, the availability of truck parking. We know one thing that creates a lot of pressure on drivers is as they get close to timing out on their hours of service, uh, they're not sure if there's going to be a safe, uh, let alone convenient place to park between uh, uh, between now and then. It's one of the reasons why we are encouraging states to use eligible formula dollars to fund truck parking and using some of our own discretionary dollars, most recently in uh, projects in Florida and in Tennessee, to directly construct more truck parking because uh, that shortage is real and an issue we hear a lot about. If we uh, have any left over after that third lane gets constructed, we'll put some more parking <laughs> on there too. <laughs> Maybe they could go together. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of All Things Logistics. I'm Jewel Williams. Today, I'm continuing the conversation of the recent hearing with the Department of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg and the Appropriations Committee regarding the 2024 transportation budget. In this clip, as you previously saw, Congressman <clears throat> Congressman Klein was highlighting uh some information in regards to the I-81 corridor. And in that previous clip, the Secretary of Transportation recognized the importance of why truck parking is necessary. So you, I've been a truck driver for what, 15 years, and I, I saw how truck parking began to wane away uh, especially on I-81. I remember back in 2010-ish, uh, probably 2011, that several of the truck parking pull-offs and things like that were beginning to close down. And that is that highway right there is, is a rough highway. Not only is it very uh, hilly and lots of um, steep mountains to go through, uh, you need your rest, you need your break spots, you need your bathroom breaks, but you know, it, it began to get tough going through that corridor. So Congressman is raising the awareness of that. But what I didn't like was that he was more focused from what I saw in the clip. He was more focused on getting three lanes as opposed to getting more parking. And he knows that that particular corridor is heavy, as you're going to see. He makes some comments about the traffic of truck traffic that that corridor handles. So before we go any further, let's go ahead and take a look. I know you're working uh, to address the supply chain challenges that are confronting our nation following the pandemic. Uh, a lot of those as impacted by uh, aging or limited infrastructure our highways, our, inf our interstate highway system in particular, uh, needs upgrading, updating. I represent the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, uh, Virginia 6, which stretches from the Roanoke Valley up to Shenandoah Valley and has Interstate 81, which runs along it. I-81 runs from I-40 uh, down in Tennessee to the Canadian border in upstate New York, as you know. But it is the, uh, the economic backbone of Western Virginia, and it runs over 300 miles in both Virginia 6 and Virginia 9 and Southwest Virginia. It, it is not just a transportation corridor for goods and services from uh, points south, Mexico, and otherwise to points north, New York, uh, and, and New England, but it's also a, a major corridor for uh, local farmers, for families, for small businesses. Um, it really is truly, truly the backbone of the, of the valley. Um, for many years, we have all agreed on both sides of the aisle, uh, along with uh, my colleague from Northern Virginia, uh, uh, Congresswoman Wexton, and, and also Senators Warner and Kane, that uh, I-81 does need a third lane. And uh, it was built originally for 15% trucking capacity, but often operates with 30, maybe upwards of 50, depending on the time of day, trucking capacity uh, or percentage of trucks. Um, it's the most dangerous highway in Virginia with over 2,000 crashes and millions of hours of delays yearly. So uh, the Commonwealth has adopted a corridor improvement plan. The timeline is challenging. And so I, I would just ask that as uh, you consider uh, resources and allocating those resources nationally to address uh, the supply chain issues, congestion issues, 
uh, that you look at the bottleneck that's being created by uh, I-81 in the valley only being two lanes, and hopefully there are opportunities within the department uh, to make the interstate safer and run more efficiently. Well, thank you. I'm uh, uh, aware of uh, this corridor improvement plan. I believe uh, there are 64 different projects that are, are, are encompassed within it and know that that's going to be a, a big lift. Uh, I'm aware that uh, uh, the, the state has put forward a lot of resources and uh, we're glad that the increased formula dollars that come with the uh, infrastructure law are, uh, are part of the mix of funding available for that. Uh, but certainly would also note that there are a number of discretionary programs that we have that might also uh, come into play for uh, many of the projects that are part of that broader vision and uh, uh, certainly a, a, an area that we're very much aware of as we're doing our work. So there you have it right there. That's the first part of uh, the conversation. And as you can see, it is a top of mind to get I-81 under control. The congressman right here um, f sees that at times that corridor can have up to 50% truck, tra truck traffic. And that just clogs the pipeline. I can tell you stories after stories of going through that corridor. There's only a few stops for fuel at your pilots and your and your TAs. I don't even know if TA is still around anymore. But there's only a few, and, and they're small. I mean, I remember going to the one pilot through that corridor, and you're wrapping around the block just trying to get that, get that fuel in that fuel aisle. And that was... Uh, in the back in the in the days where fuel costs were up uh, as well during the 2008-2009 um, market uh, situation, so the Congress people they know the problems. They understand that it's important to improve these corridors in order to improve the supply chain. You can't just throw on EV vehicles into this this problem and expect it to just go away there are, are logistical steps that need to be taken and each kink needs to be addressed and therefore you need to have teams on each of those links and those teams need to have captains that communicate seems simple to me but it doesn't seem simple to our government and it could be manpower i don't want to sound like they can just snap their fingers and fix it i know that we are challenged with a lot of things going on right now, yet I do believe that efficiency, lack of proper training, lack of leadership, some of those things are impacting whether or not these projects get completed to improve our current situation. And then when you pile on inflation and when you pile on other issues that are stopping up the supply chain and, and interfering with the flow of how things are uh plan and built out that it really does uh, cause some issues. So in this next clip, we're going to take a look and the, the congressman addresses a couple things. He addresses ELD mandates. He addresses uh, more of truck parking. He addresses speed limiters uh, in trucks. And I definitely want, want you guys to take a look at this stuff because these are things that you as freight transportation professionals, whether you be a truck driver, or owner operator, or you're in the dispatching and the 3PL side and the freight broker side, whether you're in the customs brokerage side, you are in the environment that is impacted by this conversation right here. And so I think it's important that everyone be paying attention to this stuff so that you can be aware and maybe even be pitching in a few ideas on how it can improve, especially if you work in these departments or if you work with these departments uh, hopefully you guys are, are getting out there. I just want to take a time to to do a little shameless plug that I'd like you to subscribe to my channel. Hit the notification bell so that you'll be alerted every time I upload new videos. And this, I, I'm, I'm building this channel. So you're going to see videos every single day now. Every single day you're going to see videos because there is so much information coming out right now in regards to the logistics of things in our economy and the logistics is the backbone. I think it's important that we get this information to the forefront. Stop letting it be a secondhand fiddle. Uh, it only comes out when the stock prices come out. It only comes about when an, another truck catastrophe comes on board. It only comes out when um, truck drivers are striking. We need to be hearing about logistics 
issues every single day because they impact our economy. We need to understand who is doing what at what times so that we can all be proactive, so that we can all be thinking about how our businesses are impacting or influencing these decisions as they come through our cities, our states, and, and our counties, because it's all we, we're all in, affected by the price of the groceries at the end of the day. All right, so let's take a look at this next clip and see what Mr. Klein has to say. About the livestock industry, which is important in the Valley, uh, the livestock industry has been exempted from uh, the ELD mandate, electronic logging devices, uh, for the last five years. Meanwhile, statistics uh, through the trucking industry as a whole show that ELDs have, in fact, reduced safety on the roads as drivers are speeding to beat the clock. Uh, how do you respond to the fact that the ELD implementation uh, may have led to less safe roadways in some areas? Well, the idea of ELDs is to make sure that drivers do not uh, drive longer than they safely can, leading to fatigue, which we know is a major cause of, uh, of crashes. Uh, certainly, if uh, there is an attempt to uh, defeat or work around that, uh, that could lead to an unsafe condition. Uh, I don't believe the solution is to abandon our, our work to uh, reduce fatigue. But I do believe that, that there are a number of steps that we can take that are part of a broader safe systems approach that will make a difference uh, in conjunction with the work we do around hours of service. And just one example that I would mention is uh, the availability of truck parking. We know one thing that creates a lot of pressure on drivers is as they get close to timing out on their hours of service, uh, they're not sure if there's going to be a safe, uh, let alone convenient, place to park between uh, uh, between now and then. It's one of the reasons why we are encouraging states to use eligible formula dollars to fund truck parking and using some of our own discretionary dollars, most recently in uh, projects in Florida and in Tennessee, to directly construct more truck parking because uh, that shortage is real and an issue we hear a lot about. If we have uh, any leftover drivers. after that third lane gets constructed, we'll put some more parking <laughs> on there too. Maybe they could go together. Um, one more question. Uh, tw truckers and independent owners, operators from my district have expressed concern uh, with the FMCSA's proposed rule for heavy vehicle speed limiters. Um, and again, um, data suggests that it's a, it's a complicated factor about the causation of, of truck passenger accidents, uh, not to mention that the rule could be particularly harmful to small business owners. Uh, does DOT think implementing this rule will be specifically harmful to independent owner operators? And how did DOT decide on the suggested 60 mile per hour maximum? I would, well, uh, I'd asked you, Mr. Secretary, to be short. You're kind of violating sorry, the rule Mr. there. Okay. Fine. He didn't uh, didn't give the Secretary the time. Uh, uh, well, the, the short answer is uh, safety is our North Star. We'll be guided by the data, and we welcome stakeholder and in industry uh, uh, input as we're uh, working toward finalization of rules. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So uh, great questions. Those are great questions asked by the congressman. As somebody who has driven for several years, speed limiters um, – they are not my favorite thing because of, I don't think they cause accidents. However, I do think they contribute to fatigue because as drivers are driving slowly to get to their destination, then that puts them behind. And if when you've got dispatchers on your, on your Qualcomm or phone saying, why is it taking so long? But they don't take into consideration that you've got a speed limiter at 60 miles per hour that those things take place. Those things need to be factored in. And I had a, it was interesting, this brings to my mind, I had a conversation with a uh, another transportation personnel and they were telling me that they use uh, on-time data that they extract from one of their software programs to determine if they're going to work with a transportation provider. And their supplier actually negotiates this particular situation, yet they pass that data on to them. And of course, they look through and whether or not they're going to do that. And I said to them, are you considering all the pieces of that puzzle? How is that app or system that you're using to evaluate on timeness or timeliness of delivery, transportation from point A to point B. How are you evaluating that? Are you factoring in traffic, road construction, breakdowns, and speed limiters? Are you factoring in whether or not they're getting loaded at the dock upon arrival? I have sat at docks for 24 hours waiting on freight. 
no joke, told that it was ready to go, get there, it ain't ready to go. And having to wait for it to ready to go. Now, a lot of times it wasn't because people didn't do what they were supposed to do. The machine broke down. Um, the, the connection to bring, you know, the material from its place of origin so that the stuff could be made got sidetracked because that broke down. There's so many other factors in this equation and attempting to get, get your hands on it all sometimes is impossible. In a perfect world, it would be pick up, drop off next, pick up, drop off next. However, that's not the case, but what can help with all of this is that each freight and transportation operations organizations like yourself take the time to understand your customers needs so what does that look like that looks like having a conversation with your customer to say this is how many trucks I've got for you what type of lanes do you need covered what system are you running it is a circle are you running a just a straight line back and forth are you running a diamond shaped what are you doing with your organization? And, and a lot of organizations are not going to give you that much information due to whatever proprietary situations they've got going on to protect their secrets. So that's where the relationship part comes in. That's where research comes in, talking to truck drivers, talking to other transportation providers, and just digging into some information to find out, number one, What's the commodity that your customer is moving? Where is their home station? How many rails roads are around them? Are they close to an ocean port, a rail port? How many truck terminals can you find in that area? It takes research. It takes research. And that's something that I do. So if you are somebody that needs someone to do some research for you, give me a call. I got you. So all of these things, though, are important to understand to build better strategies, you've got to have all the pieces of this puzzle and understand all five points, okay, including the center. So one, two, three, four, and the center is a point because things are going to go up and through and out left and right of that point and having a good understanding of it is important. So I hope these videos are helping you out. If they are Please subscribe to the channel, share it with somebody that you think can benefit from this information. And I would love to get your feedback. What's going on in your district, in your area, in the corridors that you're driving in? Are you experiencing this type of stuff? Are you researching this type of stuff? Is it, have you spoken with your congressman? Have you even thought about speaking with your congressman? Because those are the ones who can make the change. As you just saw from the three videos that I've done this week, each of them is addressing a specific problem specific to their region. And so if that particular congressman on that committee has a concern, chances are every single congressperson in our government has the same concern or a similar concern because each and every one of them, even though they may not be on the committee, they have a road that is going through their district and is connecting trucks and warehouses and retail stores and they are also looking for solutions to the problem so get in their ears find out what plans they have visit their websites call their offices communicate to them I encourage you to do that so once again I'm glad that our government has these topics at top of mind because we need these things to be taken care of and my question for this one is how can the industry keep people working while it goes through these changes, should owner operators be subsidized while we go through these changes? As the industry irons, irons out all these sticky spots, the owner operator is being impacted. It is a small business like any other business. And it needs assistance to maintain its cost, cost for fuel, the cost for just maintaining the truck, the cost for expanding food, all those things. It needs expenses like everybody else. So what are your comments to this? Leave them down below. I'd love to get your feedback. I want to thank you for watching and I will catch you on the next video. Have an awesome day. Peace.